Welcome back to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan Greck, and on today's episode, I'm going to cover the top five mistakes that I think people make when they're starting out in overlanding. And I wanna be really clear here, I made some of these mistakes myself, so I'm certainly not trying to bash anyone or I'm not trying to say you're doing it wrong. What I'm really trying to do is help you learn from my mistakes and the mistakes I've seen other people make so that you can hopefully avoid them and just get on with the enjoyment and don't go down the money pit. So if you've always wondered or if you're thinking about getting into overlanding, stick around. Here are the top five mistakes that beginners sometimes make. So there's no doubt about it. The first mistake that I think is such an easy trap to fall into is we all assume that you need the biggest or the best or the most equipped vehicle to get into overlanding. And I see this all the time on online discussion forums. Someone says, hey, I'd like to get into overlanding. What do I need? And it's really standard. People say, you should upgrade your tires, upgrade your suspension, get some rock sliders, get a winch, get some bumpers. That'd be a good place to start. And that always really surprises me because if your goal is to roam up to Alaska or to explore the neighboring country, I mean, 99% of people in the world that have ever done those things, they don't have all the gear that someone just said you need to get into overlanding. So you definitely don't need all of those things, especially if your goal is to explore remote places rather than actual go crazy with off-roading or four-wheel driving, you know, rock crawling in Moab. And while that applies to four-wheel drives, the same is also true, I think, on the van life end of this, where now we have these vans that start at $150,000. They have inbuilt floor heating, they have air conditioning, they have enough lithium ion batteries to power the rover that just went to Mars. But again, you don't need all of those things. That's like the highest end vehicle in history. But in reality, if you wanna roam up to Alaska, you can just buy a bone stock van, throw a mattress in the back and go and have adventures. So I would say more than all of the other mistakes combined is this idea that we need a monster vehicle that is like the best in every category. And I fell into the trap myself too. I poured months of my life and tens of thousands of dollars into a diesel conversion that didn't work because I thought I needed a diesel, but it turned out not to be true. So above everything else, try not to fall into the trap of thinking that more gear or bigger gear is actually better and it's actually what you need. Another common mistake that I see people make all the time is they simply bring too much gear, which means they have too much weight. And it doesn't only mean too much weight, it also means that all of their gear becomes a burden. When I was just up on the Dempster Highway in the fall, I got back down from the Arctic and the Jeep was covered in horrendous mud. And I watched other people who had to unpack kind of two thirds of what they'd brought with them. They had to get it out in the rain and put it on the ground in the mud just so they could get out their camp stove and try and cook dinner. And to me, that just felt like the opposite of enjoyment. And it was all because they had all these crates full of stuff. They weren't even going for very long, but you know, oh, maybe we'll wanna read this extra book and maybe we'll need this extra toy and you know, this iPad and just goes on and on and on of all the things that like maybe we'll need, so we better bring them with us. And so my advice as always is start going out on the weekends. You're only gonna be out for a couple of nights, so you really don't need to bring everything and the kitchen sink. Just think about the things that are gonna bring you enjoyment and the minimum set of things that are gonna bring you enjoyment. That way you'll have less stuff with you, so it's just less burden and less packing and repacking. But most importantly, you're gonna have less weight. And less weight is really important because it'll be less wear and tear on the vehicle. And also, driving the vehicle is just going to be more enjoyable. I can tell you from experience, driving an overloaded vehicle, it's stressful and getting tossed around in the driver's seat as you go over corrugations or bumps, it just isn't very enjoyable. And going walking speed when the going gets a bit rough, sooner or later you say, why am I even out here? This is just gonna take forever to get to this beautiful waterfall. Maybe I'll just turn around instead and I won't even go to the waterfall. So 
Having too much weight, it really starts to detract from the whole trip and you start to think it's pointless. So my advice is try to have the minimum set of things that you need. Don't try to have the maximum set of things. Another really common mistake that I see people make all the time, and again, I made this mistake, is choosing the wrong suspension for your vehicle and your needs. And I think this is easy to do because tons of people are coming into this from the four-wheel driving world. And I think also there's a lot of people out there and a lot of companies who want to tell you they have the best suspension for overlanding. Whenever I see that, I roll my eyes and I know that they're full of it because how can they possibly know what type of overlanding you want to do? They can't. They can't know if you're talking about driving up to the Arctic Ocean or if you're talking about tackling some of the trickiest trails out the back of Moab and being out remote there for a week. They have no idea. They also, more importantly, have no idea how heavy your vehicle is because they don't know what you've added. If you've got a fridge and solar and a rooftop tent and all of the creature comforts and enough gas and water to be out for a week or two, chances are your vehicle's really heavy, like mine is. In that case, you need a suspension that is designed to carry weight. So my biggest piece of advice when it comes to suspension, if it is advertised based on how much lift it gets you, which is very much a four wheel driving thing, you know, it's a two and a half inch lift, it's a four and a half inch lift, that's purely for four wheel driving. That's gonna define how big of rocks you can drive over and how big of tires you can fit on your vehicle, but that's really not what you need. What you need is a suspension that is designed for how much weight it can carry. So any suspension you're looking at, call up the company and say, how much weight is this designed to carry? And if they can't answer the question or if they kind of arm and are a little bit, they haven't designed it with long-term overlanding in mind. They've just designed it with, let's lift the vehicle up, throw big tires underneath it and go crawl over some rocks. So think long and hard before you purchase your suspension. And you've heard me say this before, I actually recommend now upgrade suspension last after you've got everything that you want and all your creature comforts and how you want to overland because then you can put your vehicle on a scale, you know exactly how much it weighs and you can call up a company and say, I need a suspension to carry this much weight because that is really the most important factor. And I hope you can genuinely learn from this mistake because when I made it, it cost me a couple of thousand dollars to correct it. So hopefully you can just buy the right one in the first place and save yourself that hassle and that money. The next most common mistake I see people make is they simply try to cram too much into not enough time. So I know we all struggle to find the balance between how much work we have to do and how much time off we get for adventures, but I think it's a real mistake to just rush and think that seeing more is better than enjoying what you actually have time for. So it's really common, people try to see like Death Valley and the Mojave Road and a bunch of Arizona, and they try to cram all of that into about two weeks. Or I get messages all the time, people wanna drive all the way up to Alaska and back in a month. And personally, I think that's a mistake because it means the whole trip is just gonna be rush, rush, rush. You're going to be more stressed, you're going to be exhausted from all of the driving, and at some point, you're just not even gonna enjoy it. You're gonna get home after the whole thing and say, oh, I'm so glad I'm home, I don't wanna do that again in a hurry. Whereas if you slowed way down and you just said, I'm gonna enjoy Death Valley for two weeks and that's it, you can plan a couple of rest days, you can plan a couple of days where you go out on foot or you do something other than driving. You can really slow down and enjoy yourself. Read a book, do whatever it is you actually enjoy doing with your spare time instead of being on some sort of strict schedule and trying to cram in a whole bunch of stuff. My personal pace when I'm going international, I spend about a month per country. Certainly I've met people who spend about a week per country and they are exhausted. Their eyeballs are hanging out of their head. And tons of them I met in West Africa who said, we're not even enjoying this anymore. We just are getting it done, which I think is a real you know, disappointment and a letdown. But then also, I mean, there's tons of people who even go slower than me. So don't feel that my pace is perfect feel out what pace works for you, where you have a lot of enjoyment and you're seeing new things and you're learning stuff. 
but you've also got time to relax. You know, nobody wants to set up camp in the dark and then have to get up at sunrise and pack up camp and hit the road. That doesn't sound like fun. So make sure you slow down and actually enjoy yourself. And the final mistake on my list today is actually a summary or it's the cause of all of the other mistakes. And I really think it comes down to being uncertain of what you want to get out of overlanding. And so I think if you don't know, if you really want to go rock crawling, or if you want to drive to beautiful places and go fishing, or you want to drive somewhere and go hiking, or canoeing, or mountain biking, or just sit in the shade and read a book, if you're not sure which one of those things you want to do, then I think you're going to fall into the trap of, well, I'll just do all of them. I'll build this mega four-wheel drive and I'll bring kayaks and fishing gear and cooking gear and camping gear. I'll bring it all and I'll try to do it all, which is never going to work. Your vehicle will be very overloaded. You'll have way too much stuff and you'll never have enough time to do all of those things anyway. But I do want to make it clear, the mistake isn't not knowing because none of us know when we start out. I had no idea how I wanted to enjoy overlanding. So it's only a mistake if you try to build your vehicle and try to do these mega trips before you ever even find out what you want to get out of overlanding. So how do you find out? As I always say, get out there on the weekends, go and do it and see what you think. Take the vehicle you already have now, throw a ground tent and a camp stove in the back and go for a weekend. When the sun rises and you're sitting there drinking your coffee in the morning, sit quietly and think to yourself, what do I want to do today? Do I want to go for a hike? Oh, maybe I'll bring hiking boots next time. Nah, I don't really like hiking. I'd prefer to go fishing. Okay, yeah, I'll bring my fishing gear next time. If you're a person who loves to cook, then yeah, I better bring lots of fresh food and probably a fridge is in my future and you can start planning like that. But until you're actually out there doing it, you're not gonna know what works for you. You're not gonna know what you enjoy. Even after you've got your vehicle, do you really want to go bash it into rocks and drive it through super deep mud pits? And if you do, great, go for it. Chances are though, I'd say lots of us, like, ah, I don't really enjoy doing that. I'm going to leave the vehicle parked for the day and I'm going to like walk around the lake or go for a canoe or whatever it is. Why am I out here in nature? Why did I drive out to the middle of nowhere on this kind of, you know, bumpy forestry road or whatever it was? So, Make sure that you know what you're trying to get out of this. And whatever your answer is, even if it's something I haven't said just now, it is 100% perfectly valid because this is about you and your enjoyment and what you want to do. Make sure you remember that. Don't fall into the trap of looking at the sales catalog and saying, I have to have everything that those people have, or even that you have to have everything I have. That's not what this is about at all. This is about you finding what works for you and how you get enjoyment out of driving into the middle of nowhere and then how do you spend your time. So make sure that you do that and you take your weekends and you go and get some experience and learn what works. Then you can maximize your enjoyment and find your own version of overlanding that works for you. I hope those five points get you thinking more about what are you looking to get out of overlanding. We all have our own approach. There is no wrong way. And what you want to do is what it's all about. If you love going rock crawling and you want to build a monster four wheel drive, absolutely, that's what you should do. But overlanding and kind of what I'm into, more about going beautiful places and seeing beautiful things. You've dreamed about seeing the Arctic Ocean. You've dreamed of exploring Death Valley and other remote locations. In that case, you don't need to spend an enormous amount of money building your vehicle into an unbeatable four-wheel drive. You really just need some creature comforts and some time so you can go out there and have the adventures. That is the core vehicle-based adventure travel, you have to make sure the adventure travel actually happens. So I hope it gets you thinking. If you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel. New videos come out every Monday and Thursday, and I'm able to do that with the help of my supporters on Patreon. 
and I'm just rejigging all of the support tiers and offering way more information, behind the scenes content, vehicle and trip consulting for my supporters on Patreon. So a ton of content is gonna start going into Patreon that only people who support me there are going to be able to see. So if you wanna learn more about what I'm up to or you've got specific questions about where you wanna go in the world or what vehicle you think is you know, appropriate or you'd like to get my input on all of that stuff, check out over on Patreon. From $5 a month, you can watch other people's consulting videos with me. And from $10 a month, you can have a one-on-one -on -one video chat with me where I'll go through your needs. So it's all over on Patreon. I'll throw a link down in the description. So thanks again for watching. And until next time, maybe I'll bump into you on the road.